Hello, everybody. It's me. It's Meg Medina. I'm so glad to be here. And I hear that I have students from all kinds of places, from Canada, Vancouver, Canada. I, I see you out there. California, Chicago, my hometown of New York. I'm sitting right now in Virginia, in Richmond, Virginia, which is um, kind of a smallish city outside of Washington, D.C. And right now it's sort of a chilly, cold day. I'm guessing that in California, maybe you are having warm weather um, and it's much earlier than it is here. But here we are together and I'm thrilled that you joined us. Um, I want to also say, uh, give you sort of a lay of the land for today. So we have about 30 minutes together. So I thought that I would tell you a little bit about my books mostly the idea of where the ideas come from. And then we're going to do a tiny little exercise together that you could write your answers to in the chat. And then um, at the end, we'll have a chance for a selfie. So be thinking about how you want to pose, get your cameras ready. And then finally, we'll do a Q&A. My friend Dana will come on and she'll help me field some questions because it's kind of hard for me to look at the feed of all the questions and talk and all of that stuff. I can't do many things at the same time. So should we get started? All right. So um, on my friend Lindsay, I think, is going to be sharing or is sharing already um, my uh, little PowerPoint. And it's called Funny, Sad and True, Where Your Stories Come From. And I thought that I would talk about this because that is like the question that kids always ask. Some authors get like, prickly about that question. They're like, well, they come from everywhere. You know, like they, it's, they've heard the question so many times. But I really decided to do a deep dive on that because that's a legit question. Because I also remember being 10 and, you know, my teacher coming to the front of the room and saying, class, we're going to be um, writing an essay today or a story today. Um, go or whatever they gave us some some broad topic and I would sit there going oh, and that panic feeling do you ever have that that panic that you don't know what you're gonna write and like what do you know and you start writing anything and then you know it's a disaster so let's take a look at where the stories came from in my books so the first thing is as you see it says funny sad and true I'm gonna show you um you know that stories really come from from my life truly so so this is what i looked like when i was probably your age okay this is me in the fifth grade one with a you know in the school picture right um and then the other on a sitting on a stump in a park that was near my house in flushing queens new york it's called casino park and so when i really think about growing up i think about it like a sweet and sour process and i don't mean chinese food i mean that sometimes growing up is really funny right like crazy silly things happen like you know you uh you know you get lost in the woods with your friends or you you tell a joke and milk comes shooting out of your mouth or um you know just all kinds of silly things happen when we're growing up. And also sometimes really hard things happen when we grow up. Being nine or 10 doesn't mean that hard things don't happen in your life, like a parent could lose their job or um, uh, you can move somewhere else or you can get sick or someone you love gets sick. Like hard things happen to kids too. So the secret sauce, I think, of writing a really good story for kids, or if you are a kid writing for other kids, is to tell the truth about that sweet and sour, about those moments where both of those things happen and come together. So for me, um, um, I think I have a slide, the next one. Um, some of the people in my life end up in my stories. OK, um, and by the way, this is me as a Bitmoji. I discovered Bitmojis like a year or two ago and I can't stop. Now I have longer hair, so I'm going to have to change her. But she was a good Bitmoji for a while. But anyway, true story. The people that are in my stories 
are a lot like the people in my real life. Here's what I mean. So for example, um, my book, my picture book, Evelyn Del Rey is moving away. I have it here in Espanol. Evelyn Del Rey se muda. It came out in both editions. So in Evelyn Del Rey, it's, it's a story about, it's simple. It's two little girls who are having a play date, their last play date before Evelyn moves away. So it took me years to sort of write this simple story, mostly because I was thinking about how to tell the story of someone that I really remember. So here's a, a picture of some of my friends when I was growing up. These are some of my first friends. Um, you can see I'm the girl in the on the top picture. I'm in the girl holding the, the glass of Coke. Um, these are girls from my building and my neighborhood and my school. I remember their names even, uh, Josephine and Laura and Kyoko and Beth. And the girl that's sort of standing in the sort of striped uh, short sleeve dress, the brown girl on that side is Evelyn, Evelyn Guzman. In the other pictures, I have other birthday parties from other years below where we're all wearing party hats. These girls, every one of them was Irish, which was kind of funny. Patty and Linda and Kathleen and Bernadette, they came one time for a party. And then on the bottom right, I think that you'll notice, you know, these were all assorted friends again, but one of these girls I think you might know, um, we're holding a rabbit. I had a pet rabbit named Cleo. The girl that's on the ground with me, I'm in the pink dress, so there's a girl with sneakers and pants on. And so that's RJ Palacio who wrote Wonder and lots of people love her book, but we, um, we were friends. We lived only two blocks away from each other in Queens growing up and we're still friends, but um, that was us back then. So anyway, let's get back to Evelyn up at the top. So Evelyn was my first friend. She was not necessarily my best friend, but her mother and father were from Cuba like my parents were. So our parents spoke Espanol, Spanish mostly and a very little bit of English. And so it made a, a big difference that they could talk to each other. And Evelyn and I lived in apartments that were very, very similar, almost exactly the same, in, right down to the plastic slip covers on the sofa that our mothers had. And I just remember that we used to wait for the ice cream man outside, that we'd play hide and seek behind the trees, that we'd run in and out of the courtyards of the buildings. And I just loved her. And for years and years and years and years, I always thought about Evelyn. I, I wondered whatever happened to Evelyn. You know, I moved on to another neighborhood and we lost contact and I, I st still think about her. So I was, that was many years ago when I was five years old, right? So I went over to uh, a place called the Highlights Foundation. I don't know, do you know that magazine at dentist's office? It's called Highlights and inside it's that, there's that copy of a magazine and, and you can do that search, like they have all the pictures and then you're looking for the picture inside the big picture. Okay, that magazine, those wonderful folks have a foundation. It's a place where writers can go and here's a picture of what it looks like. It's like a gigantic campground for writers and illustrators, people who draw pictures for books. And we go there to work or to teach each other how to do our jobs better. So I went there um, and there was an illustrator named Shadra Strickland who said um, she, she was teaching us how to do picture books. And so she said, let's sit down, all of us, and write down all the problems that we can think of that kids have growing up. I said, oh my goodness, that's going to be a long list. And she said, okay, and we're just going to go. So I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. I have here my trusty phone and I have it set for one minute. So in one minute, I want you to think about all the problems that a kid can have growing up. And it could be things like 
I got a bad haircut. I threw up in gym. I forgot my gym clothes. My teacher hates me. Whatever it is that you think are problems that kids have, um, start writing them. And I'm going to give you one minute. And then when you look at that list, I want you to decide whether these are funny things, sad things, or maybe both. And then put some of them in the chat because I want my friend um, Dana to be able to pull some out because I want to hear what some of your horrible problems are. Are you ready? Okay, and there's no good problem or bad problem or anything like that. Just suck it to it. Ready? Go. Oh, there it is. OK, take a look at your list and then you can put funny next to it or sad, whatever. Pick one or two and share them in the chat. I'd love to find out what some of your things were and we'll talk about them a little later um, when we, you know, at the, at the end when we start wrap, um, wrapping up. So I did the same thing that you were doing. We had a little longer. We didn't have a minute. We had maybe two or three minutes, but I mean, I wrote everything as fast as I can. And you know, I was I was thinking, 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 and then I said, best friend moves away. And suddenly I realized that I had a way to tell this story about Evelyn, this friend who I loved that alone, like, that just wasn't a good story because there was no problem, right? I, I'm going to write a book about a friend, right? But suddenly, if I could take the real memory I had of this person, Evelyn, and mix it with this common problem that a lot of us have, our friends move away. If I could put them together, I was going to have a good book. So um, I started writing. And um, I don't know about you, but I always, you know, the the book that you see, the finished book is almost never like the first draft. Here's what my first draft looked like. You might notice um, that it says Evelyn Moray is my mejor amiga, my numero uno best friend. Come play Daniela, she says, just like she always does. But guess what? This is Evelyn Del Rey. So originally I had a different name for her. And that was just one little thing that changed, but in picture book and in really writing anything, you probably are the same way. You change stuff. A character is short in one version, you decide to make them tall. They have brown eyes in one version, you decide you're gonna give them four eyes and they're all green in another. Like you, you change it as you get to know your character. But I'm not the only one doing a rough draft because the artist is also doing a rough draft. Take a look at the sketch. So the person who do, drew the pictures for the book is Sonia Sanchez, and she lives in Spain. Sonia um, also, we, we didn't meet in person. I still haven't met her, which is, happens all the time with illustrators and writers, but she practices too. And this is her rough draft stage. This is the, the rough draft, the, the um, black and white one, is in that section where Daniela is explaining how she and um, Evelyn are the same and different. And so in that first drawing, you notice that she has the mommy, right? She has the mother in the background, and in Evelyn's house is the mother and father like outside of the door, and 
and it's kind of close together. But when she got to the final one, what she did was this. She separated it more. And she took out away the parents. She kept the pets, the hamster and the cat, but she separated it more and she gave them a connection. This um, this game, right, that they can play with a laundry line, sending things back and forth to each other. This skinny little line where they could stay in contact. I really liked that because the picture sort of suggested what was going to happen for these girls, that they were going to have to stay connected with some unusual way. So um, here's, here's more sketches, more black and white ones. I just wanted you to, to see. So everybody's practicing. So when you're doing your own work in your classroom and you get these rough drafts back with like suggestions from your peer editing group or from your teacher and inside you're really angry and you're like, I don't want to do this again. Please know that real writers or you are a real writer, but professional writers and professional illustrators are always doing drafts and rewrites and and adjustments right down to the time that it goes to press. So you're not alone. It's in the, the tweaking that we get it right. Um, I wanted to show you this was the first time that I saw the girls together. Sonia sent this to me in in uh, by email and here come these girls. So I never described the girls. Right. I just told Sonia about my friend Evelyn, how we were both Latina girls, different races, but we felt exactly the same on the inside and there was enormous love on the inside. And so here they come, a girl with glasses, hair puffs. I don't have hair puffs, but believe me, if I ever wanted hair puffs, it was this day. So cute. I love the coat. I love everything. I just fell in love with these girls. I thought she did just a great job. Sometimes what was interesting is that Sonia was telling a slightly different story than I was. I don't want to spoil it for you because I, I hope that some of you are, are reading Evelyn Del Rey is moving your way or Evelyn Del Rey se muda so that you could see what I mean. In the last panel, the, the sentence that I have says, you know, they, they separate and she's uh, Daniela says something like I will always uh, my friend that I will always remember by heart. Right. And so look at this color circle here. That's what it really looked like. This is the sketch in the beginning, but the color is what it really looks like. And there's Daniela suddenly looking older with letters and a trunk and pictures of Evelyn. And suddenly I could see that Sonia told in pictures how these girls solved the problem and how they figured out how to keep each other in each other's hearts. When I got to that last page and I turned it and I saw it for the first time, I went, <gasps> and then I knew it was exactly right because it felt surprising and exactly true because we can keep people that we love in our life. We found that out last year and we may have to continue to find that out for a little while more this year. How we stay connected with the people that we love, even if we can't see them. So, you know, sometimes illustrators and writers, even though they're working on the same book, are telling slightly different stories. Now, if you are not reading Evelyn De Del Rey, but you are reading Medici Suarez Changes Gears, I have some of the same kinds of ideas for you here. Here was the original cover. Here is the, the yellow one is the paperback cover, which I love. Here's the truth. Sometimes a story grows and it sticks to you and you can't take it off. Um, I want you to take a look at um, the next slide because Merci Suarez as a character began in this book, Flying Lessons and Other Stories. If your library doesn't have that book, make them buy it ask them for it because it's a collection of stories. Ten authors writing stories for middle grade readers, um, each with a main character from a, a different group. And so Mercy first was in that story. And when I finished writing her short story called Soul Painting Ink, I couldn't stop. 
I, I loved her. I was so curious about her. And I started to wonder, well, who does she live with? And where does she live with? Where does she live? And how how is school going for her? And like I had all of these questions and then I knew that she needed a bigger book. So how do you populate a book? How do you find characters? Again, I'm going to say that you look around to the people in your life. Here are the people in my life um, that I used in that book. First, my DS, my aunts, right? That's the Aisa. The lady with the squares is, is my mother. I'm in the yellow dress. The Ajeras in the white dress. And on the other side, my abuelas, my grandmothers, and me looking very miserable on my first Holy Communion. So um, I'll just give you a couple of examples, right? My aunts were very much a part of my life, right? Just like the Inez is in Merci Suarez Changes Gear. But my grandmothers, what I decided to do is take both of my grandmothers and make them into the one abuela character in Merci Suarez. So um, Fefa, the lady below there, was my father's mother. Are you related to anybody who you think might not like you? Be honest. OK, I think that my grandmother, I tested her every last nerve. I was too excitable. I was too loud. I ran around. I always had scabs on my knees. I was a trial to this woman and she was strict. Like when you went to Fefa's house, you had to use a quiet voice. You had to eat all your vegetables, even the radishes. And I hate radishes. She was something. But inside of all of that sort of mean strictness, there was also enormous goodness. Abuela Fefa only went to school until the eighth grade, sixth grade, I'm sorry. And she was a seamstress, which means she was a person who sewed clothes. When she came to this country from Cuba, she got a job in New York and she sewed clothes. And on, in the other slide that I, I, I'm gonna go back one slide, um, you can see, you see those dresses that are on the bed? She made them all. Every year on my birthday, she would come with two bags of clothes for me. It was my whole wardrobe for the year, which is really handy. My mother could not afford a lot of things. My mother worked in a factory. She earned very little money. And Fefa was really a help. Um, sometimes when I got on my mother's last nerve to straighten me out, my mother would send me to spend a few days with Fefa. And that's when I had to tangle with La Boba. Next slide now. So you see this thing? That's called a dress form mannequin. A seamstress like Fefa turns a knob on the back. It makes it bigger or smaller to get the size of the person. And then they pin the fabric on and they create the pattern and they can create the, what they're sewing on this dress form mannequin. OK, so at night, I want you to picture me in a little bed in, in Fefa's sewing room with the light from the alley coming in, shining on this thing. And it would have pins in the neck and that awful knob in the back. And it would give this headless, handless, legless shadow all over me. And I would sit in that bed going, oh, I'll be good. I was so frightened and so when I was writing Abuela for Mercy, I wrote an Abuela who could sew. I wrote La Boba because I remember her so well. And then I also added all those fears that Abuela has because my other grandmother was afraid of everything. So I put them both into one. Um, the other thing that I took was the setting. It's set in Florida. We don't have any Floridian schools out there, but I said it in Florida, even though I grew up in New York. And why is that? So look at this house. What's missing? The roof, right? It's flat. In Florida, there are a lot of houses like this. They're like super, super flat. They're like little boxes. And my mother had cousins who lived in Florida in houses just like this. And it was three generations, Julia, Yuli, and Yuli Ling three generations, three houses side by side, and they had figured out how to make little paths from one to the next. 
and you know like they used everybody's house was all the same like if you wanted milk and you didn't have any you went to their house if you wanted to watch tv on somebody's better tv you went over there like that so when i was writing las casitas i wanted to write this Cuban family living intergenerationally, that means with grandparents and parents and kids all together, which is fairly typical in Latino families. Not always, there are plenty of Latino families that, you know, that have a mom or two moms or dad or whatever, but often you'll see intergenerational families and maybe your families are like that, where your grandparents live with you or your aunts or your uncles. But I wanted that because it's how my mother most wanted to live and because my aunts were always so much a part of my life and I wanted a big Barinsky family where everybody's got opinions and everybody's bossing you around because that's what it feels like when you're 10, right? That everybody is telling you what to do. And then the last little piece from life that I took was from my teaching life already when I was grown. Check it out. I was a teacher. I could have been your teacher, guys. This was me a million gillion years ago with my first little third grade class. I still remember their names. I still remember where they sat in my room. And then the black and white picture is later when I taught high school. But when I first started teaching, I was one of those very excitable teachers. I had a project for everything. I don't know if you've ever had a teacher like this. Like they love dioramas. They love doing a play. They love making a project. Like the bigger, the better. I was just like that. And I think probably all the parents of the kids that I taught were probably plotting like for something terrible to happen to me because I, they always had to go out and get supplies and all kinds of stuff for the next project that was happening. So one of the projects was a mask making project and I remember that we used like plaster paper paper mache plaster on a kid's face Jeremy Soto's face in fact and he had the most beautiful thick eyebrows and we picked him because he was just so still and sweet and easygoing and we needed to put Vaseline everywhere on his face so that it wouldn't stick to him except we forgot some important parts of his face. So when it came time to take off the mask, he was stuck inside. So you can't make stuff like that up, right? Those kind of disasters are, are you know, you just gotta take them right from life and say, I'm using this right in this story. And so when it was time for Edna to get what was coming to her, I said, hmm, Edna, I have a mask for you. And I wrote that scene very similarly to how it happened. So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because sometimes when we're young and we think we might want to be writers or illustrators, we worry that we're not enough, that we're not interesting enough, that we're not smart enough, that we're not, that we don't have enough support or money or all kinds of things that we create in our mind as reasons why we can't do something. And I'm here to tell you that you're enough. That your everyday life, the people you know, the people who make you laugh, the people who hurt your feelings, the people who are really special to you, all of those people together create memories inside of you that you can use for characters, for events, for settings and you shape them into a story that you want to take tell. It doesn't have to be exact. You can you stretch the truth and so on because it's pretend. But the beginning of it, that little piece that's really true that's going to connect with the kids who read your story, that you've already lived. So next time, when we do this list, like this list, list that we did of all your problems, like I see some people got, uh, you know, getting hurt is for sure a problem of childhood. And I use that in Mercy, right? Like M Michael Clark got a baseball right to the face, right? So how did you get hurt? Did you go sliding off your sled? Did you fall out of a tree? Did you get shoved? somewhere like you can use that event in a story 
Um, okay, so what's next for me? I, I want to tell you is that this year, da, 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 Medici Suarez Can't Dance is coming out. It comes out April 6th. So if you have finished Medici Suarez Changes Gears and you want to find out what happens to these people in the seventh grade, this is the book for you. And please, if you read it, do let me know what you think. I'm so excited. Um, you know, there are new characters, including the kid on the cover there. That's Wilson Bellevue. Medici runs the school store with him um, this year. So uh, let me know. Let me know what you think about that. Um, and of course, you know how to stay in touch with me. You can stay in touch with me on, I have a Facebook author page, um, I Instagram and on Twitter. Um, so you, you can always catch me there. Or if you go on my website, www.megmedina.com, you can subscribe or have your teacher subscribe to the newsletter. And then every time I do a new post, which is every couple of weeks, two or three weeks, uh, it'll come right to your mailbox and you can see what's up, what I've been reading, what I recommend, what I'm cooking, all kinds of stuff like that. Okay, so let's see. Um, all right, so I am thinking that we have, oh, look at this other problems I saw getting yelled at. Oh, never fun. I don't like being yelled at. Um, Oh my goodness, Rosie said, my dog was eating bubble gum. A bubble mixture, oh my God. If, can you imagine if he hiccups, poof, bubbles everywhere. Those are, those are tough problems. All right, um, I think I'm gonna invite my friend. Uh, we're gonna do a selfie first, right? So um, let's, let's do this. Let's get ourselves together, get your, um, you know, your teacher, get yourself in front of the screen. I'm gonna try to do a pose. My goodness, the sun is shining through, so I'm going to move over a little bit. I'm going to pose for you, and you guys pose either in front of your screen or your camera or anything like that. Um, and when you, if you want to post them, please post them to fl uh, hashtag Flipgrid for all. That's the hashtag we're using. I'm going to give you a few seconds to get in place. Are you ready? All right, and I'm going to try to be as as balance as I possibly can. I'm going to put these on my head. Okay, you ready? All right, I'm going to do, I'll count on three. Ready? One, two, three. You got it? Okay, let's try this other one. Just plain. Okay, I hope you got a good picture. And I'm going to invite my friend Dana to come join us really quickly because you've been asking questions and I think she's going to read them to me because I, as I said, you can see I talk a mile a minute. So it's hard <laughs> for me to talk and read all the questions. So Dana, what have we got? Hi. Yes, hi Meg. So everybody, I'm Dana. I work at Candlewick Press where we publish Meg's wonderful books and I have some awesome questions from all of you to give to Meg. So I'm going to start with how many books have you made? Oh, yes, okay. You know, I had to check that out because the very first book that I made no longer exists. It's called Being Out of Print, but I think eight in total. Um, and then I'm working on three new ones. So eight exist or have existed and three are coming. That is a lot of books. Um, next, we have two similar questions. Ava asks, what got you into writing books? And Noelle asks, why did you become an author? Well, thank you, Ava and Noella. Um, That is, okay, so I tried everything not to do this because I was scared. My mom really wanted me to have a job that was very secure, you know, that would have medical benefits and give me a good salary because she was worried. She knew what it was like to worry about things like rent and food and stuff like that. And sometimes when you work in the arts, sometimes in the beginning, especially, it can be hard to make enough money to support yourself. And so this wasn't really a popular career choice for me to say, I'm going to be a writer. But here's the thing, 
sometimes you, ha you find that you have to do something because it's the only thing that really makes you happy. And that's really the truth. I did lots of jobs that I was good at. I was a teacher and I liked being a teacher. I was a newspaper writer. I liked writing articles for the newspaper. I wrote press releases. Those were pretty good, but there was nothing that I loved more than writing. So I think just because, you know, my family always told lots of stories and because I just really wanted to do it, I, I decided to take a risk and try. And I was very lucky that I tried. I stuck with it even in the beginning when it was hard. And um, eventually I got better at it and, and you know, people started to buy my books. Uh, well, we're very glad to be an author. Um, I have one more question here for you. Did you have an author role model? Oh, you know what? I have, I feel like every day that I wake up, I have author role models. Here's a beautiful thing and the truth about children's publishing. It's filled with beautiful people. And I don't mean physically beautiful people, although there are several physically beautiful people. I mean that these are people who have these really full, playful, open hearts about the world. These are people who move in the spirit of hope. These are people who think that who you are as a kid is a sacred thing that we should protect that time and we should tell kids how to grow up safely and, and with strength. And so I'm thinking of like my friends Lamar Giles. I'm thinking of, you know, incredible historical fiction writers like Elizabeth Wien. I'm thinking of Elizabeth Acevedo. I'm thinking of Rebecca Stead. I'm thinking of RJ Palacio. I'm thinking Oh my God, there's just too many, too many to name. Which is why I think you guys should spend lots of time in the library and getting to know the librarian who can, who can feed you. Um, the names of, of books like Jerry Craft, like, oh my gosh, I could just keep going. Um, just to be in the company of their work and their thinking and their abundance is, is a beautiful thing. So yeah, I think every day that I, I'm out making books and meeting author friends and reading their work, they are my heroes. I, I live with them every day. Thank you. Thanks. So listen, my friends, guess what? I think we have reached, let me just make sure. Oh my goodness, I think we have reached the end of our time. So I want to remind your teachers, teachers out there, that there is an activities page, Candlewick has an activities page, not only for these two books, for, but for I think several of my titles in there. And, and also on Candlewick's page, you can, you can always find discussion guides and activity guides for my things. But um, I want to thank you all for inviting me into your lives today, um, especially at the beginning of 2021. We need to move forward with a lot of hope. And so this was just a great way for me to start the year with all of you. And um, I wish you luck, happy reading, happy writing, y mucho cariño. <laughs>